Good morning, my friends. A little, little bit louder. I'm, I'm actually not saying good morning. I'm checking the mic. <laughs> now I'm going to, but I will say good morning. Good morning, my friends. How are you? It is a, a joy to be together for the, the first uh, Friday uh, devotion and Christian in law of the, of the semester. I have a, a, real, a real honest joy in my heart to see all of you, you again. Uh, I've, I've had to, I, a lot of time to spend with the, the one L's, but you two L's and three L's. It is such a, a pleasure to see all of you as, as well. Uh, with that sense of, of, of joy at being back together again, uh, let's pray and then we'll rise together and sing. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, please bless us this semester. May we gain and grow in Christian wisdom. May we gain and grow in knowing you and most importantly, in loving you. May the, the honest voice of our, our mouth and our lips and our heart be to praise you with thankfulness and joy at your goodness. Our Father in heaven, bless us this semester. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's rise together and sing. This semester in, in Christianity and Law, we'll be discussing uh, the praise of God and specifically how we uh, give praise to God for law. How we give praise to law, uh, how we give praise to God for the courts, how we give praise to God for the judges, for the litigants, for the process, for our role as counselors. Uh, and today, as an introduction to this, I want to, to give you, uh, I, I sent to you this copy of, a, of an article uh, that I've been, I've been working on, Calvin on Divine Love and Litigation, Two Approaches to uh, Christian Theory. Um, but fundamentally, it's an article about uh, why we should praise God, why we should be constantly persuading other Christians and ourselves that the, the law is a good gift from, from God. So just to, to provide you uh, some, some background to this uh, article, uh, yesterday uh, I uh, was happy to celebrate my 20th anniversary at the uh, university. This is, I've completed 20 years of teaching here and I'm very, very happy about, about that. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I think over uh, 20 years of uh, teaching and uh, studying uh, about how our faith in Christ relates to the law, uh, this is by far uh, the most important uh, single truth that uh, I have, I have uh, found at the center of everything Christians should be concerned about with respect to, to law. Um, I was at a, a, uh, a lunch not long ago with uh, two professors at Emory uh, University. Uh, and a, a professor I greatly admire, uh, John Witte, was uh, asking me about uh, you know, what, I, what I thought, having uh, taught for a long time, uh, was the most important thing about Christianity and law. And I uh, began to outline the, the thesis that we're going to talk about this, this semester. The most important thing is for Christians to consider the ways in which the law is something that we should give God praise for, the way in which we should uh, persuade ourselves and persuade others who are Christian uh, to rejoice in the law because it is a, a good, good gift that the more we understand about the law rightly, the more we will give thanks to God, the more we will look upon God as someone good, the more we will give him a glory. And uh, Professor, Professor Witte was looking at me somewhat skeptically. Uh, his, his concerns are, are largely, uh, he's a great scholar, his concerns are uh, largely historical and how Christian faith has influenced the rules of law. How uh, without Christianity we wouldn't have modern contract law, modern tort law, modern property law, modern constitutional law, and, and so on. And he's a great scholar of the ways in which Christianity has affected and influenced the law in ways that are, are essential to the whole modern shape of the law across the world. 
that, that without, without Christianity, uh, the law of Korea, the law of, of Europe, the law of, of South America, North America would be fundamentally unrecognizable. And that the modern world should give thanks to Christianity uh, for all of these good things that we enjoy. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm looking at him and, and you know, I, I know you can tell when people scrunch up their face a, a, little, a little bit. Um, so this, this woman at the table next to us interrupts our conversation and, and goes, uh, lays a hand on me and goes, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can, can you please explain that to me again? Can you please say that to me again? I've been practicing law for 30 years. I'm a Christian, but I, I have no sense of joy or thankfulness in what I do. Please, please uh, tell me, how do you give thanks to God while you're practicing law? Now, I had to pay her several hundred dollars afterwards. I'd hired her uh, to say that. No, no, she, she was, she was, a, it was a wholly natural uh, phenomenon. Uh, but she represented, uh, I think, what, what many Christians feel, uh, what many Christian scholars feel, which is they, they, they practice law, they do good work, they, they may have a general sense that uh, this is part of their vocation, uh, but they have no particular joy, no particular thanks to God for the law. Uh, and... Uh, so I was able, Professor Whitty goes, oh, I, I guess people do, are interested in, in what you're, you're saying. It's very happy uh, for me in that conversation. But I, I, of course, have experienced much of this in my life. When I say it's, it's the most important thing, um, I, have, I have academic uh, theoretical reasons for thinking that understanding what is good about law, specifically uh, how law leads us to glorify God and love God as a theoretical matter must be the most important thing about it. What it is about law that leads us to love God more must be the most important thing about it for us. It's not the most important thing about it if you're trying to solve a, a problem of social chaos, perhaps, perhaps, but it is the most important thing to sustain us and to transform our work in the law, from something that is cold and analytic to something that is an expression of our, our whole life. And friends, our whole life should be seeking constantly in everything we do to deepen our love of God. It should be seeking in everything we do, as Paul says, to give God glory. Everything we, we do should be a response to God of, of praise and glorification and love. Amen? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I mean this truly. I, I think after, after 20 years of, of teaching, this is uh, the most important thing. And uh, it's, it's a, a difficult thing to do because loving God is difficult naturally. And if we try to love God naturally through our own, our own power, we find ourselves distracted with many other kinds of loves. This is a, a fundamental challenge in human life. Uh, and we face this at many levels. At a very basic level, we tend to love lower things more than higher things. So when, when you go home at night, um, you love watching Netflix. Did I get that right? Did you say Netflix? You love watching Netflix, okay. Um, or maybe you, you like looking at your TikTok videos or your, your Instabook videos or whatever it is you're, you're doing. And, and you know that there are things which are better than that. You know that there are things which are better than that. And yet, we end up have, finding it easier to spend time on things which we know are lesser goods than things which are greater goods. Um, so we just experience this. I, I know it would be better for me to spend my time studying law than, than walk, watching my, my TikTok, Facegram uh, book. 
but that wasn't a joke, professor. It really is better to study law than do those, those things. Um, but we, we are torn away from that for some reason. And so one of the ways that, that we, we do this is we can motivate ourselves by fear to study law. If I don't study, I'll, I'll do badly on the exam. But that's not how we want to do it. That's not how we should do it. We, what, we, what we want is to have hearts that choose what is higher and, and best uh, naturally. We, we want to be uh, persuaded. We want to, to see for ourselves what is best and, and choose it freely, not be scared into doing it or bribed into doing it. We want to do it naturally, freely. Um, and, and so uh, what we're going to work on this, this semester uh, is how, how do you uh, bring your mind around to what is good? How do you uh, direct your mind to what is good? By the power of the Holy Spirit, how do we, do we move our minds to what is good? And the classic category of this process, this mental process by which we recall ourselves to what is good from what is bad or from what is less good, is praise. We praise it. And I can praise things to other people, or I can praise things to myself. And the, the process by which I move my mind from what is lower to what is higher is praise. Um, if you're watching a, a movie on Netflix that I've already seen, and I know it's bad, you're watching a uh, Fast and Furious 18 on Netflix, Professor Ku's favorite movie. It's so much better than 17, isn't it? When that truck explodes in midair, that's a great scene. Um, but, but I say to you, I say, don't watch that. Don't watch Fast and Furious 17 because Fast and Furious 3 Tokyo Drift is so much better. The action scenes are better filmed. The dialogue is more ruggedly masculine in its affirmations of driving fast. Um, I, I try to move your mind from what is less good to what is of a greater good. And, and hopefully then, I don't have to threaten you and say, if you watch Fast and Furious 18, I'm going to come over to your house and I'm going to beat you up. That might work, right? But that's not how you want to choose Tokyo Drift over Fast and Furious 18. Does that make sense? We, we have a, a, an existing word, apparatus, and it's, it's fundamental in the scriptures. It's so fundamental in the scriptures that in heaven with God, when the kingdom of God comes in its, its fullness, our occupation will be praising God. That is to say, our, our minds will be directed constantly in everything we do to the glory of God and enjoying his, his glory. And in the meantime, the scriptures tell us, praise God, constantly. Praise God. You should be constantly offering the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving with your tongue. You should constantly be doing this. Why? Because it's better to watch Tokyo Drift than Fast and Furious 18. And it is ever so much better to be thinking of God and to be loving God and to be contemplating his goodness in your life than it is to be thinking about other things. Does that make sense? So we want to do this this semester. Uh, we want to, to learn the tools by which when we are, we are downcast, when we are weary, when we are focused on interpersonal conflicts in our law firm, when we are focused on how much work we have when we are focused on whatever sadness or difficulty we face in life. Instead, we can lift our minds to the goodness of what we are doing. Uh, instead, we can lift our minds. We know the path of thought by which we can lift our minds so that we can join with the saints in the, the, the scriptures, those great people of faith in the scriptures who, when they faced persecution, when they face difficulties, instead of focusing on those things, we're able to rejoice in God, even in the midst of their, their troubles. 
Uh, the reason I've provided you with this, this article is one thesis that we'll be talking about uh, this semester, but not for a while, not until we get into the basic elements of, of praise sub, is that this was once a widely understood uh, practice and idea. It was, it was once widely understood that the, the basic way you needed to approach a, a subject was to understand how to praise God for it. You needed to understand the, the ways in which the thing was some minor uh, aspect of God's greatness, and that by participating in the thing, we could move ourselves towards God. Uh, this was a very common way that Christians approached subjects. I, I would even argue more than common, it was the, the basic understanding of what marked out a Christian approach to subjects differently than a non-Christian approach to subjects. Um, we're not going to get to that for a, for a while, to that historical part for a while. We'll talk about that. We're going to review a, a number of uh, old uh, Christian legal theorists, and we'll see that they do things like name their books in praise of the laws. They, 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 their approach to things is to teach you how to praise them, how to give thanks for them, as uh, things received from, from God, and that this was very, 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 very basic. But uh, in the intervening point, we're going to do a lot of, of practical work about how you praise things, what praise is, uh, how we practice praise. And, and so today, I just wanted to, uh, to point you to another authority who happens to agree with me. Uh, I think he's a great authority. I think he's the, the greatest of the reformers, uh, John Calvin. Uh, he, he was a, a, a Frenchman, but we shouldn't hold that against him. That's an anti-French joke. My wife is French, so I can make that joke. Hi, honey. Uh, he was a, a, a French man, and he, he lived in an age of great persecution. Uh, he uh, announced the truths of the Word of God boldly, and because of that, he was forced to, to flee his, his home country and was never able to return in his whole life. And he faced uh, much difficulty and, and many burdens uh, from the legal system. Uh, but as we'll see, he thought, when you thought about the legal system, even though it had persecuted him, even though it was a, a source of great difficulty in his life. And even though later in his life he labored in the legal system and he found it burdensome. He found it a, a very burdensome thing having to deal with law and, and politics because of the strife and the difficulties. Nevertheless, when he turned to write about the legal systems, laws and politics, and he just writes, he covers all, everything that we do in law school he covers in a very small chapter at the end of, of his work, The Institutes of, of Christian Religion. Just a very short chapter at the, at the end of it. But when he turns to it, he says, people think a lot about these things, um, and it is not out of place for us in a work which is intended to stir up the love of God. That's what he, Calvin thinks the, the word religion is e equivalent to love. Right? The institutes of Christian religion are trying to teach you piety, that is, how to love and revere God. He's not concerned with truths in the abstract. He is concerned in the institutes of Christian religion, not theology, religion, with how do you stir up love for God in your heart? What are, what are the ideas that lead us to love God more and worship Him more and praise Him more? And so he says, it is not inappropriate in this work for me to consider these things. Because in considering them, we consider in what ways they are useful. They are given to God as useful to Christians to love and glorify him. So again, he thinks it's appropriate in a, a manual of devotion, a manual that is trying to set out for us why we should love God, why we should serve God religiously, that is through worship, 
and prays. He thinks law is an appropriate topic. Why? Because rightly understood as Christians, it makes us love God more. It makes us praise Him more. It, make it makes us more devoted to Him. Okay? So I, I'm going to read through uh, this introduction with you and then circle back and explain a, a few points. I'm going to be reading the, the part that I sent to you in the email to read, the, the introduction, and making a few, a few comments about it. It begins with a, a quote from 1 John that actually I talked about on Tuesday in our first uh, devotion. And in our, our first devotion, uh, when we were discussing this, we, we looked to understand why if we are mainly concerned with uh, love, if love is a, a measure of the law, why is it that we should, we should read the Gospels? Why is it that we should look at the Gospels to understand what love is, rather than looking at the way that love is amongst us? And I quoted this passage, 1 John 4, 10 through 11. Because this is love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. A very basic way of, of understanding this passage. Suppose someone comes to you and they say, um, I don't understand why Christians go on and on and on about love. Uh, my experience of love is very bad. Uh, I had a girlfriend. I went in the army, and she broke up with me. I loved her. And my, my, I didn't, I've never been in the army, okay? So <laughs> I, I'm just appealing to an experience, okay? Um, my experience with love was very bad. Okay, I, I, I tried to love someone and I failed. I tried to love someone and I failed. I was untrue. I was unfaithful. Um, I look around the world and people say they're in love, but then they get in arguments. They, they seem petty. Um, love doesn't seem like such a great deal. How can, how can all of the law, as we read in Matthew, how can all of the law hang on love when love is so untrue, when love is so uh, partial, when love is so incomplete and decaying in the world. I look around the world and people don't seem to love each other. I look in my own heart and I seem very bad at, at love. What I mean by love, in my experience, is, is very base. And, and this, is, this is addressing this. This is love, not our love. Not, not the way we love each other, but the way God loved us. God is love, John says, right? What we mean by love really is not the love that we see in the world. This is a hint. This is a suggestion. This points us to something else. The, the love that we see in the world between a, a husband and a wife or between two, two good friends or between people generally in society we like this, but we recognize its imperfection. We recognize that the fulfillment of it is not with us. Because this is the love that we're talking about. The love that we're talking about is God's love. And that love he has shown us most clearly in Jesus Christ. And that's why for, for devotion, when we're looking at, uh, and, and Calvin also calls, 1 Corinthians 13, he calls it a great praise of love. He calls it a eulogy, which you'll learn the term, but it just means a praise. A eulogy of love. And when you read that, you know it says things like, love never fails, but our love fails. Love is patient, but we can be impatient, right? And th this is why, because this is the love that we're talking about. Not the love that we have imperfectly, partially, but the way in which our, our love is a participation in the perfect love of God. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And since God so loved us, so also we want to love one another. So I get the idea of love mainly from, perhaps at first, from seeing my parents. And when you're a child, it's easy to idealize the love of your parents. 
Or when you're first in love with another person, it's easy to idealize that love. Uh, but we quickly realize through experience our loves are, are imperfect. And God, through the gospel, has enabled us to move on from our imperfect love and to recognize the perfect love of, of God. And once we recognize that, then we can begin to love each other more perfectly. If I only take as examples the imperfect loves around me, my love reaches a limit. But when I encounter the perfect love of God, when I recognize what it's really supposed to be like, then I, as it were, return and show a more perfect love in the world. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, this explains the, the basic thesis of, of Calvin on law. This is the basic thesis of, of Calvin on law. This is the next quote in the introduction. It is of no slight importance to us. That is to say, it's really important. It is of no slight importance to us to know how lovingly God has provided us with rulers, courts, and laws. So that a greater zeal, zeal is an energetic expression. To be zealous means to be filled with energy and positive action. It is of importance to consider, to know, to know it, to be sure of it, that God has loved us by giving us laws and courts and rulers. So that greater energy, passion for piety, that is to say, reverence and love for God, may flourish in us, may spring in up in us to attest our gratefulness. So this is the idea, very simple idea. It's really important that you consider the ways in which God has loved us by giving us law, that law is a good gift to you, that it expresses something loving about God to you, so that it will make you more zealous. It will make you more energetic about loving God because you are grateful. Okay? So, I mean, imagine um, your friend sees you be rude to somebody. Your friend sees that you're rude to somebody. And they come up to you and they say, you were just really, really rude to him. And they were like, yeah, I don't like him very much. And you go, don't you know that he was the one who was your secret Santa and gave you that great present last year? Don't you know that when you were sick and unconscious, he rescued you? Don't you know these things that he has done for you, which you have lost track of? Don't you know what he has done for you in secret? And if you learn about something that someone has done that's good for you, then your attitude is transformed. You feel gratitude. And instead of treating them disrespectfully, you treat them respectfully. Don't you know what God has done for you? I, I, I see you, friend, and I see that you're flagging. You're not zealous in the respect and love you show for God. I see that you lack energy. You don't have a passion and a joy. I see that you neglect God. I see that you, you turn away from him. Why do you do that? Why wouldn't I do that? You shouldn't do that because he has been good to you. Now, this is not where Calvin starts. Calvin starts, of course, with the great goodness of God in rescuing us from the slavery to sin and the slavery to death through the, the sacrifice and the suffering of Jesus Christ. God has given himself for us. He has borne pain and suffering and humiliation that we might live and live forever. He has died that we might live. He has suffered that we might rejoice. He has made the world good for us. We, we, there are many, many good things that we can count on. And in your churches, 
this should be a, a primary theme of, of the preaching of the gospel. How good God has been to you. How if there were no laws at all and the world were in chaos, nevertheless, we could rejoice in God because we have forgiveness of sins and eternal life through the death of the Son. We could rejoice, nevertheless, in any difficulty. But for lawyers, and believe it or not, you don't know that in the law school, most people aren't lawyers. Do you realize that? When you're in a law school all the time, you think everybody's just thinking about the law all the time. But most people aren't. For most people, the, the law is sort of an invisible background noise of the world. But for us, it's front and center. So what Calvin literally puts last, it is literally the last thing he considers, for us, needs to be more primary. Because we're going to spend all of our lives doing this stuff. And if you are focused on this and lose track of the fact that you can rejoice in the Lord as you practice law, that you can realize how it is a gift from God, then you miss out on a lot. Okay? It's of importance, Calvin says, that we know how lovingly God has acted in giving us rulers and laws and courts. Right? It is important because if we consider that, it will stir up our devotion. It will stir up our piety. It will stir up our love of God because we will see that it is something we should be grateful for to God for. Does that make sense? Again, just a very homely metaphor. If, if you see somebody that is being rude to their parents, it is appropriate to remind them all the good things that their parents did to them. It is Im important to remind people who are rude to their parents or inconsiderate to their parents, why are you doing this? Your parents have worked for you. Your parents gave you life. Your parents do good things for you. Right? Don't do that. Be grateful to them. Love them. Honor them, as the scriptures command. Right? All we're doing, Calvin says, when we consider law as Christians, our fundamental duty, our first order business, is to make sure that when we're living under laws, when we're as lawyers working with laws, we do so in a way that makes us love God more. Amen? Well, that only took 30 minutes to get through the first two quotes, but anyway. <laughs> I'll start in on the introduction. We'll see how far, how far we get. Uh, Calvin's Christian legal theory, then, promotes piety. Um, I, in the, in, when I talk with Professor Witte or other American scholars who are interested in, in Christian legal theory, uh, they are mostly interested in how a knowledge of Christianity can inform what the law should be. How do we convince people to uh, have the right law of marriage or the right law with respect to abortion or the right law with respect to property? They, they are interested in a very, very, very important question, which is what are the right standards of law? Um, and they consider this a practical question, which it is, an urgent question, which it is. Uh, but Calvin, I think, exactly, exactly rightly thinks those are urgent questions. And if you read through the Institutes, he engages in those questions. He talks about what the right standards of law should be. But he talks about them after and in principles which are derived from the ways in which the law makes us love God more. For a Christian, before we get to telling everybody else what they should be doing, before we get to telling the world what they should be doing, and that's important. And as Professor Witte has charted out, if Christians hadn't done that, the world would not be the world it is today. The, the, the very standards of, of law that the secular world is most proud of, they would not exist today. Our concern with liberty, our concern with people's rights. All of these come from, from Christians who kept urging and urging and urging the state to consider the rights of the least, to consider the poor, to work out impartial standards of, of justice. 
These are our accomplishments. But Calvin is saying, quite rightly, I believe, the first work of the Christian lawyer is to figure out how the law incites, increases our love of God. So Calvin's Christian legal theory promotes piety. What is piety? Piety, as Calvin means it, is just our personal reverence and love of God. What it is to be pious towards God is to love him and revere him. And loving and revering something are very similar things. To revere something is simply to look upon it as of great, great, great value, of great, great honor, of great, great, great worth. To love something is, in some sense, to be attracted to it, to be in a, a, a relationship of it that has the strongest ethical, that has the, the deepest bonds and ties of, of faithfulness and commitment. It seeks things for their own good rather than things that we don't love where we use them for our own good. My, my food on my dinner plate, if I say I love it, uh, that's an odd way of, of, of speaking. Uh, I love the taste of it, perhaps, but I, I destroy it. And if you, <laughs> Dean Lee is laughing because he's seen me eat. When I eat, there is no doubt what I'm doing. I'm not playing around. I am devouring it, right? I lay waste to that food. That's why he's laughing. Um, it's kind of messy with a beard, by the way, but you have to be careful. But things that we love, we don't destroy. We, we, don't, we don't use them up. We, we serve them. We revere them for their own sake. If, if, if we say that we love you as students, it's because we're not trying to use you up. We are trying to help you to be all that you can be. We're hoping you can be more, that you can grow. We, we love you because our relationship to you is not for our sake, but we want you to receive goods, okay? Christian legal theory should promote piety. Piety is, is reverence and love. Christian legal theory should help us to revere God more and love God more. To promote piety, third sentence, Calvin seeks to show how law is God's good gift to us. It is a way God loves us. As God provides us with a measure of food, with a measure of shelter, with a measure of clothing, through nature and through our work, God also provides us with a measure of peace, with a measure of justice, with a measure of right, through our legal system, and as lawyers, through our counseling people and through our litigation. Seen properly, Law is another reason to be grateful and love God in return for what he has done. It is a, 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 a spring that feeds into a mighty ocean of our love and gratitude to God. It is one source of the great ocean of blessings that we have from God. So that we will love God more in the small part of the institutes devoted to a Christian understanding of law, Calvin wants to show us, quote, how lovingly God has provided us with law. And that's the legal part of a much greater work in the institutes. The, the overall aim of the institutes is to do the same thing with respect to all of God's great works. How God has acted for us in Jesus Christ. The, the great blessing that we have, the great blessing of new creation in Christ and original creation, you know, in creation. We, we have two amazing blessings from God. The world, which he made from nothing, as a great grace and gift for us. And the new creation that has begun in Jesus Christ, that's realized in you through your faith in Jesus Christ, and will be realized for all creation through Jesus Christ at the end of times. If the big work of Christian faith 
is to transform your life by making you love God more, by showing you how good Christ has been for you, how great the Father has been for you in creation, how great the Holy Spirit is in transforming your heart. The small work that we have as lawyers is to show that for law. And note that if Calvin has analyzed this correctly, that is to say, if this is the primary work of Christian legal theory, when Christians reflect on the law, if Calvin is right that the first thing we should do is consider how do we praise the law so that we can understand it as a gift from God, then Christian legal theory today has abandoned the most important task of legal theory. It's given it up. I understand why it has. The things in the world seem so bad. Uh, the, the, the oppressive and unjust features of the world today seem so bad that they draw our attention immediately. It doesn't require anything theoretically to know that many of the laws that exist in the world today are very, very unjust, unfair, and they're hurting people. They're, they're destroying people. And if you love people, then your first instinct is to deal with those questions. Perfectly, perfectly fair. This is a theoretical question. When we reflect on law, when we, we take time out and try to think about the whole, the whole system, what is the way in which we should understand the law? I'm not trying to, any of you who have passion for justice, I'm not trying to slow you down. I'm not telling you to give up on that, but I will say this. If you are only motivated by anger at injustice, if you are only motivated by a recoil from the injustice of the world, if the primary way that you relate to the legal systems of, of the world is to be upset about them, that is not fundamentally a sustainable attitude because if your life is consumed with anger and sadness, you have alienated yourself from the joy that you should feel in Jesus Christ. You, the, the basic approach of the Christian to the world is not fear, anger, upset, even with unrighteousness. Our, our praise of God and our celebration of his triumphant righteousness is greater then the secondary thing we do, which is to condemn unrighteousness. And we condemn unrighteousness not because it's a fundamental task. We condemn unrighteousness to help people. But Calvin says, look, remember, if you look at things naturally, your, your love of humanity will leak away. The, the reason Christians love other people differently is because they know God has loved them. The, the reasons why Christians have a different kind of love from the rest of the world is because their eyes are focused on the love of God. The, the reasons why Christians are willing to sacrifice for other people is because their eyes are focused on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Why should I sacrifice for you? Well, there's really a very good reason for that. Because you live through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so he has said quite reasonably to you, if I have sacrificed myself for you, then you should be willing to sacrifice yourself for others. If I haven't focused on myself, but I have focused on you, then you should focus on others as well. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? Following Calvin, rather, Christian legal theory should show law, not merely law's large part in preserving the peace of this world and common good. And that's a quite reasonable thing to think about. Law has a super large part in keeping this world peaceful and keeping very, very, very bad people from harming the weak and the poor and in increasing our prosperity by coordinating our lives together. That's a big part of the law of the work, of the, the work of the law. But the first concern of the Christian is not the large effect that the law has on the world. 
but the small part it plays in drawing people to the kingdom of God. The small part that it plays in showing God's glory is more significant than the large part it plays in securing our own benefits in life. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is forever. Because in your life, your great challenge is not to care about the things of the world. You do that quite naturally. Your great challenge is to guide what you do in this world by the kingdom of heaven. So, as I say here, this article and what we're going to be doing this semester aims to recover this principle. That courts, law, and judges are gifts from God. And seen as loving gifts help us to love him more. This is what we should be focused on. Now, interestingly, Calvin not only thinks that this is good for you spiritually, which it is. I don't, I don't mean to condemn spiritual benefit. It's, it's very good for you. But for those of you who are still focused on shouldn't we just get to the practical work of law first, Calvin says what you need to understand is loving God makes you a better lawyer. Loving God makes you a better lawyer. And I, I discuss this just a little bit in footnote of four on page two. Calvin makes the, the interesting claim that the best source of jurisprudence is a source that makes you love God more. That the, the best way to be a lawyer, you will become a better lawyer if you are deeply, passionately filled with devotion to God. Why? Well, uh, Calvin has a very interesting discussion. Some of you may know this passage in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 4, where uh, Paul is talking about litigation. And he's telling the Corinthians, you guys are, are really messing up the way you approach litigation. You are really messing up how you settle disputes in the courts of Corinth. And he says, don't you know that you will decide disputes between angels. You will judge angels. If you are capable as a Christian to judge angels, how can you not be capable of deciding disputes in this world? Okay, that's, that's what the scriptures tell us. And Calvin goes, look, a lot of people read this and they, they think that's crazy. He, they say, uh, Calvin says, it's like saying, uh, because you know the matters of God through Jesus Christ, that therefore you should be a better physicist or chemist, or the actual example he uses is astronomer. That if you know Jesus Christ, you know more about the stars than people who look at the stars all the time. And he says, that's a valid objection. Uh, knowing God, knowing spiritual truth, does not make you better at most arts or sciences. But he says, the scriptures teach us that the law is different. Because what the law requires is judgment. It may not seem to have much weight. For it is, it is as if one should say, the saints are endowed with heavenly wisdom which immeasurably transcends all human doctrines. Therefore, they can judge better as to the stars than astronomers. Now, this no one will allow, and the ground of objection is obvious, because piety and spiritual doctrine do not confer a knowledge of human arts. But my answer here is this. Between expert and ju expertness in judging and other arts, there is this difference. The form of judging depends on equity and conscience. Calvin's point is very simple. When we, we look at the scriptures, when they say appoint judges, they don't say pick the guy with the biggest head. They don't say pick the guy with the most experienced judging people. They don't say test people and see who knows the law the best. What they say is 
Pick people who are just. Pick people who are righteous. Pick people who are fair. And this is a great divide in the world. What is it at center, the great gift which is necessary to ground expertness in the law? Is it knowledge or is it conscience? Is it an understanding of fairness? And most people who look at lawyers, they look at legal outcomes, and they scratch their heads and they go, we have no idea how you talk to yourself into something so unfair. They, they look at the world around them and they go, I don't know how you talk to yourself into this, but anybody with the smallest modicum of conscience, sense of equity, sense of fairness, would know this is wrong. And thank the Lord that the, the people of this world have oftentimes more sense about what is just, right, and fair than the lawyers do. I mean, this is the great, to the extent that democracy is a great gift, it's a great gift because the people as a whole are less likely to talk themselves into outrageous injustices than intellectuals are. Look at what you can talk intellectuals into. Look at communism in the 20th century. Intellectuals can talk themselves into the wildest ideas about what justice are. But common people know that murdering millions of people to affect economic transformation isn't just and fair. So Calvin's point is really simple. Not only is this a spiritual good, not only is focusing on the law in a way that makes you love God spiritually good for you, it's practically good for you. Because the kind of heart that you need to be able to make strong legal judgments is not simply affected by how much knowledge in the head you have, but how much purity and righteousness of the heart you have. So this will be our work this semester, to learn the principles, to learn the mechanisms by which when we consider judges, when we consider the lawyer's role as a counselor, when we consider litigation, when we consider the courts, we cannot look at these things merely as things to be used for some other good. But we can rejoice in our Lord. We can give praise to God and grow in our love for other people in a way which will make us better lawyers. It will grow in our love for God, which will make us better people. It will fill us with joy instead of fatigue. It will fill us with zeal instead of inert inactivity. It will make us better people and better lawyers. I, I tell you, uh, after 20 years of, of teaching this subject, I think this is the most important lesson. This is the most important aspect of Christian legal theory. John Calvin, I think, teaches the exact same thing. That lady at the table next to us, despite Professor Witte's worried brow, she agrees this is the most important thing. She seemed like a nice lady. Believe her, too. I'll throw all my evidence at you. Um, at the end of this semester, I hope, I pray, that all of us will know how to love God more as we study the law. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, please give us this, Lord. Help as, as we study the law, as we study the law this semester, to learn how to love you more. And as we love you more, to love others more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.